were in the same youth group together back at this small little white church in Arcadia called Mandarin Baptist Church of Pasadena. And um, yes, we did a lot of really awesome stuff to go fun and also serious. And one of the things that he is an expert at is in Chinese history and as it relates also to spirituality and religion. And so today I'm just going to be giving us his talk and his understanding of that from what he has researched. So why don't we give him a well, warm welcome to uh, David Tom. Thanks, Peter. So I'm really happy to see all you guys here, uh, especially uh, you know when it's raining and it probably was a little bit difficult to be here uh, with the traffic. Um, the message I have for you tonight is uh, something I learned about myself through a pastor, a common pastor of mine with uh, Peter, back when I was only just a teenager. So, and it had a really profound effect on my life, and it really changed, um, you know, it helped me grow my faith, and it really changed my view about God and about myself. So, it was a huge blessing to me, and I just want to share the same blessing with all of you tonight. So, why don't we get started then? All right, so let's get started then with a question. Um, in the English language, what's the difference between God and God? One with, with a capital G, the other one with a, a lowercase g. What's the difference? Well, if I showed you a few examples of their usage, uh, I think the difference is going to be quite clear, right? So here's an example. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That's capital G God. So what does capital G God mean in the English language? Well, he's the creator, obviously, right? He's almighty. He's all-knowing. He's the supreme ruler of the universe. He's holy. He's just. He's righteous. He doesn't like idols. And he hates sin, right? But yet... Even though he hates sin, he loved us enough, according to the Bible, to send his one and only begotten son to die for us on the cross so that you and I don't have to pay for our sins in hell. So that's capital G God. Right? So here's an example of lowercase g God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. First commandment right, of the ten. Right? So what does lowercase g God mean? Well, it could be an idol. It could be money, possessions, pleasure. It could be almost anything and everything that is worshipped. Right? It, could also, it could also be anything and everything that is your meaning in life other than the one true God. So essentially, there are many, many false gods, but one true God with a capital G. Many false gods with a lowercase g, but one true God with a capital G. Right? So let me now ask you a second question. What is the proper way to say capital G God in the Chinese language? The Chinese language doesn't have an alphabet where you can just capitalize or lowercase something. Right? So how do you express it? Well, turns out there are two thoughts, two schools of thought on this, okay? One school of thought says that sin, that would be this character here, is the correct way to express capital G God. The other school of thought says Sandi and Tian. Um, Tian just means heaven. Sandi literally means the Lord on high. Sang means up or high or above. D is like Lord, okay? So those are the two schools of thought on how to express capital G God in the Chinese language. Now, how do we know which one's the right way? Well, I could actually quote you quite a few uh, scholars and historians and philosophers in our own Chinese history, but I would probably be boring you if I did that. I think the easiest way to show you the difference is simply to just open the dictionary. So let's do that. So here's a dictionary. In this dictionary, under creator, it says Sandi. So Sandi is the creator. Okay? Under Sandi, it says God with a capital G. Okay? Under sun, it says lowercase g god, deity, spirit, and mind. Okay? Here's another dictionary. In this dictionary, under God with a capital G, it says creator and ruler of the universe. And then it says da xie. What does da xie mean? Capitalized, right? Da xie, sang di. Okay? So capital G god is sang di. Okay? Here's another dictionary. Sang, when used with d, means supreme ruler, god with a capital G. Here's another dictionary. Almighty means Sandi. Sandi is almighty. Okay? Starting to get the point here? In this dictionary, for those of you who are kids and going to the Chinese school, you should be familiar with this dictionary, right? Because this is the dictionary you're using, or supposed to be using. Um, under sun, it says lowercase g, God, deity, mind, spirit, expression, look. Under D, when used with song in front, it's God with a capital G. Right? Now, so far, I've only shown you a Chinese-English dictionary. Um, if you use a Chinese-Chinese dictionary, it actually gives you a little bit more information. 
So let's take a look. So here's a Chinese Chinese dictionary, and I'm going to read this in Chinese, and then I'll translate, okay? So under Sang Di, it says, Gu Si Chen Zang Guan Yu Zuo Wan Wu De Tian Di. Okay? Gu Si means in ancient times. So Sang Di is a god whom we knew in ancient times. Our forefathers knew him. Chen means to call or to name. Zang Guan, in control of. Yu Zuo, universe. Wan Wu, all things. The Tian Di, the god of heaven. So put this together, what does it say? In ancient times, Sang Di is the one whom we call the god of heaven, and he was in control of the universe and all things. Okay? Second definition, it says, okay? It refers to the God of the Christians whom they believe and worship, Yehovah or Jehovah. That's Jehovah in Chinese. So you put the two together, what does it say? In ancient times, San Di is the one whom we call the God of heaven. He was in control of the universe and all things, and he's the same God as the God of the Christians whom they believe and worship, Jehovah. Now, let me show you what else the dictionary says in the Chinese dictionary. Sang Tian, okay? Again, Sang means up or above, Tian means heaven, okay? First definition says Sen Tian, which just means to ascend to the heavens, okay? So if you use it as a verb, it means to ascend to the heavens. But if you use it as a noun, look at what it says. Zi Sang Di. It refers to Sang Di. It is another name for Sang Di. Two names of the same supreme almighty God. So the proper way, just by just opening the dictionary, and every school kid in China is learning that capital G God is Sang Di, okay? The proper way, just by opening the dictionary, to express the name of the one true God in, the Ch in Chinese is Sang Di, or Tian. This is the name of God whom our forefathers knew since ancient times, okay? Now, some of you are probably wondering in the back of your mind, isn't Christianity a Western religion? Chinese civilization is 5,000 years old. Isn't Christianity only 2,000 years old? After all, Christ, the entity, right? Gets its name from Christ, right? How can the forefathers of the Chinese people possibly know the one true God of the Bible? Now, these are all good questions, and we're going to answer some of these questions tonight. But I'll tell you right now, the answer has something to do with the picture you see in the background of this slide. But I'll get to that later. Okay. Now, first, um, I, I just want to introduce to you uh, a chart. Uh, it's Sebastian Adams' chart of Earth history. It was first published in 1871. And I have a re reproduction of it over there. Um, can I get whoever it was? Oh, yeah. yeah. Could you hold up the other side for me real quick? Okay. Or maybe just pull it, yeah, pull it up so we can actually, yeah. Yeah, this is too long. <laughs> well, anyway, maybe you guys can, if you want to stand up, you can stand up and look. But anyway, um, this chart basically and it's, it's flopping over. <laughs> Yeah, maybe fold it up and, or, oh yeah, that's good. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. So basically, this is a really long chart. <laughs> now, top half of this chart, or top portion of this chart, is basically biblical history, the history that we find in the Bible. Because the Bible mostly is a historical book. The bottom part is secular history, and in between is the timeline, okay? And there's only two things I want to mention about this chart, um, and I'm going to come back to it later, too. One, one thing I want to mention is Abel. Okay? Abel was first generation after Adam. Adam was the first man according to the Bible. And according to the Bible, Abel was a prophet. Okay? Chronologically speaking, he's the first, man, first person mentioned as a prophet uh, in, in, in the Bible. Uh, the other, and just, for, just for now, remember that because I'm going to come back to Abel later. The other person I want to mention is Noah. So Noah lives many generations after Abel. And according to the Bible, God sent a flood to destroy the entire world for its wickedness and sin. God judged the world. And the only people who survived was Noah and his family. And according to the Bible, Abel and Noah both knew the one true God of the Bible. And there were people in between, many people. Every generation, there has been people who have believed in the Bible or believed in the one true God. And Noah knew the one true God. And according to the Bible, we are all of one blood. We all came from Noah. He's our forefather of the, of the human race after the flood, which means every single person in this room is related to each other. We're, all, we're actually all relatives. We are of one blood. And Noah knew the one true God. And since all ancient civilizations came from Noah, you would expect to find evidence that all ancient civilizations knew the same one true God as the God of the Bible, if the Bible's true. So, and China, of course, is an ancient civilization. Thanks. We're going to put that down. Yeah. So you can take a look at that later if you want afterwards. Um, it, I brought it here so you guys can examine it. 
So according to secular historians, recorded history began about 6,000 years ago. According to the Bible, the creation of the first man, Adam, occurred around the same time, 6,000 years ago. So the two match up in that regard. All ancient civilizations began after the flood, and they all came from Noah. And if the Bible is true, if that's all true, then the knowledge of the one true God should also be retained in, if you go back far enough in the ancient past. And I'm going to give you just one example. There's several examples in, of this in Scripture by itself. Uh, but I'm just going to give you one example tonight. And there's a reason I'm, giving, I'm picking this example. And it'll become clear later. Okay? So it says in Exodus, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. That's translated from El Shaddai in the original language. Okay? But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. So according to the Bible, Abraham knew the one true God by the name El Shaddai. He did not know him by Jehovah. The name Jehovah was not revealed to him. Okay? Even though it was the, name, the, the main name that the Hebrews know him by. Now, when we go to Genesis 14, we encounter a man by the name of Melchizedek. He is not a Hebrew. Abraham is a Hebrew. Melchizedek is a Canaanite priest and king. So these are two different ethnic groups. Okay? And we read here in Genesis 14, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, translated from El Elyon in the original language. So Melchizedek knows the one true God by the name of El Elyon. Abraham knows the one true God by the name of El Shaddai. Now, watch what happens when they encounter each other. So we later read that, And, he's, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram, this is Melchizedek speaking of the Most High God, El Elyon, possessor of heaven and earth. So he's claiming, Melchizedek is claiming, that Abraham's God is El Elyon. Now, how does Abraham respond? Does he say, oh, wait a minute, his name is El Shaddai? Is that, is that what he says? Or does he accept El Elyon as a legitimate name for the one true God? Well, if you read a little further down, it says, And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up mine hand unto the Lord, the Most High God. According to his own words, he's acknowledging El Elyon as a legitimate name for God, the possessor of heaven and earth. So this is one example in Scripture where you have two different ethnic groups. In fact, they're from two different nationalities. And they accept each other's name for the one true God. Two names for the same supreme almighty God. So just want, to keep, just want you to keep that in mind because I'm going to refer to this later. Okay? Now, let me also just tell you a little bit about some of my main references. The first one I want to mention is the Book of History, or the Su Jing, or the Sang Su. It's, two, it's the two names for the same book. It was compiled by Confucius. It begins with the most ancient history of our people and ends in the middle of the Zhou Dynasty, which is the time that Confucius lived. It was, highly, it was a highly esteemed, esteemed text for thousands of years, and until the last century, it was widely studied. In fact, back in the days of the dynasties, if you wanted to get a job as a government official, you had to study this book. You had to know it really well. You were tested on it. And that made sense, because if you're going to be a government official, you should know your own history. Right? And much of what we know about our earliest history comes from this book. Okay? The, other, the second uh, reference I'd like to mention is the Confucian Analects, or the Luing Yu. It, it is a record of the teachings and sayings of Confucius. It was written by his disciples after his death. Confucius is regarded as the greatest sage, philosopher, and teacher of the Chinese people. And just so you know, I have the Su Jing with me, a copy of it, okay? in this edition. It has the original Chinese on top. It has the English in the middle and commentary. So you're welcome to look at this afterwards if you like. And also have the Confucian Analects. And in this edition as well, it has the original Chinese, English translation, and commentary on the bottom. Okay? Uh, third reference, third main reference I'd like to mention is the records of the Grand Historian, the Siji. It is written by Han Dynasty Grand Historian Sima Qian and his father Sima Tan. It is considered a monumental work on the history of ancient China up to the Han Dynasty. Sima Qian is considered to be the greatest historian to have ever lived in Chinese history and is often called the father of Chinese history. I have an abridged edition of the records. Okay? An unabridged edition would be very, very many volumes long and would not be practical to bring in. But a lot of the stuff is actually available online now, so you actually don't even need hard copies anymore. And last but not least, uh, one of my main references is going to be the Holy Bible. It is a collection of 66 books written by 40 authors across thousands of years. It claims to be the inspired word of God written specifically for the human race. It contains a record of the beginnings of the human race. Out of all my references, this is the only book that claims to be the inspired word of God. Okay? None of the other references make such a claim. Okay? 
Now, you also have in your hand this chart, both in English and Chinese. So my presentation is going to be more or less uh, chronological, more or less, in order. So when I talk about a certain dynasty or a certain person um, or whatever, you'll be able to look at this chart and pinpoint the approximate period in time in human history that we're talking about. Okay. So that was all introduction, so let's begin. <laughs> all right. So if we open the first few pages of the book of history, the Su Jing, it begins with a ruler named Yao. He is one of the great rulers from China's legendary period from before the founding of the first dynasty. For the longest time, everything we knew about the legendary period came from just this one book that Confucius compiled, the Su Jing. But recently, that's probably going to be changing soon. So as of last year, Emperor Yao's capital has now been unearthed by archaeologists. Okay? So it's probably something that's going to change soon. According to the first few pages of the Su Jing, and before I read this, let me just mention one other thing. When I quote Chinese text, I'm going to give you the original Chinese on the bottom, along with its reference. Okay? So for those of you in the audience who can read classical Chinese, Wen Yin Wen, feel free to read it. Okay, it says in the first few pages of the Su Jing, the Emperor Yao said, O chief of the four mountains, destructive in their overflow are the waters of the inundation. In their vast extent, they embrace the hills and overtop the great heights, threaten the heavens with their floods, so that the lower people groan and murmur, is there a capable man to whom I can assign the correction of this calamity? So how does Chinese civilization begin according to our own history book? It begins in the aftermath of a great flood. How should all ancient civilizations begin according to the Bible? In the aftermath of a great flood. These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. Yao was considered to be a righteous and intelligent sage king. Yao is best known for having passed the throne not to his own sons because they were evil, but to a lowly common man named Sun who was virtuous and morally upright. So now we're at the second ruler of the legendary period, the second and last ruler. After proving his moral worthiness, Yao offers the throne to Sun. Sun declines and requests that it be given to someone more virtuous than himself. Yao was unable to find such a person, so Sun reluctantly accepts the throne. Upon ascending the throne, this is what we read about Sun. Thereafter, he sacrificed specially but with ordinary forms to God or Sandi. The first thing he does upon ascending the throne was to sacrifice and worship Sandi. He also sacrificed the reverend purity to the six honor ones, offered their appropriate sacrifices to the hills and rivers, and extended his worship to the host of spirits. Now, Sun's sacrifice is the first mention of the worship of Sandi in our own records. And it was done with blood sacrifice, with an animal blood sacrifice that you kill an animal at, at the altar. And it was done at the round mound altar, or the Yuan Chiltan. And there's one of these round mound altars standing today in Beijing. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Our forefathers did venerate their dead ancestors and other spirit beings, which they should not have because that is actually one of the things that led eventually to idolatry. But that does not mean they did not know the one true God. All this means is that the Chinese branch of the human race is just as prone to error as any other branch of the human race. Now, what do we believe about Sandi at this very, very early time in our history during the time of Sun? We believe that he was eternal. He's a creator of all things. He lives in heaven. He's a good and righteous God. You never make an idol of him, and you never enter his presence without blood sacrifice. Now, how do we know those things? Those are all biblical doctrines. Those are all the biblical doctrines on the nature of God himself that we find in the Bible. After Sun, the next ruler was Yu, sometimes called the Great Yu or the Da Yu. He was appointed the throne by Sun for his contributions in introducing flood control. He gained widespread popularity for draining off the remaining floodwaters in the North China Plain. He is the founder of the Xia Dynasty. He was considered to be of upright and moral character, and this is what we read about him in the Su Jing. Among the ancients who exemplified this anxiety, there was the founder of the Xia Dynasty, that would be the great Yu. When his house was at its strength, when, when he was at the top of his political career, when he had all the power and all the fame, what did he do with that power and fame and influence? He sought for able men to honor God. He used his power and influence to find men who were virtuous and morally upright so that they can worship and honor God. Our ancient ancestors believed that honoring God was the most important factor for our civilization to flourish. And until the time of Sun, virtue 
was the defining qualification for one's worthiness to be the next ruler. From the founding of the Shah dynasty onwards, heredity became the determining factor. And thus, we have the very first dynasty. The first Chinese dynasty was the Shah dynasty. It lasted for about 500 years. For a long time, everything we knew about the Shah dynasty came from just two sources, the Su Jing, the Book of History, and the Su Ji, the records of the Grand Historian. But recently, that's going to be changing. So recently, the Shah dynasty capital has been unearthed. So little by little, a lot of the things that we read about in our ancient history passed down by Confucius and our ancestors is turning out to be a reliable source of history. The 17th and last ruler of the Xia dynasty was Xia Jie. He was known for his extravagant and promiscuous lifestyle and an oppressor of the people. During the latter years of his reign, a man named Tang won many supporters and eventually overthrew the Xia dynasty, thus ending that dynasty. Tang becomes the first ruler of the Song dynasty after overthrowing the Xia. All the kings of the Song dynasty have been verified through archaeology via the discovery of the oracle bones, the Jiagu one. The oracle bones were turtle shells or ox bones engraved with Chinese characters, many still preserved to the present day. And here are a few pictures of some Song oracle bones. The oracle bones revealed that Song Di was already an all-powerful, all-knowing supreme ruler over all things since China's earliest beginnings. And you never make an idol of him. Shortly after Tang assumes power, the empire was afflicted with a severe drought that lasted for seven years. By the fifth year, the situation became dire. Basically, the rivers and streams were all drying up. People throughout the empire sacrificed to Sandi and earnestly prayed for rain. Tang appointed a day for one last great sacrifice. This was his last ditch effort. The day arrived and the multitude gathered. To everyone's amazement, Tang himself was the victim. He had dressed himself up as the sacrificial animal. He fell to his knees and prayed the following prayer. O oh, great and sovereign Lord above all, that would be Sandi, may I, your humble son, presume to solemnly use a dark-colored ox to offer sacrifice and pray to you. The dark-colored ox was himself. He addressed himself up as an ox. Those who have sinned, I dare not pardon. All that is good or evil, I dare not hide from you. There is nothing that you do not know. If I have sinned, let it not be attributed to the people. If the people have sinned, let their sins rest upon my person. He was about to take upon the sins of the whole nation and offer himself up as a sin offering. After, after Tong had uttered his prayer, he cut off his hair and, and had his hands tied and offered himself as a sacrifice. Just then, a cloud burst of rain fell and the drought was at last relieved, so he did not have to sacrifice himself after all. So let me ask you a few things about his prayer. How did Tong know that he needed to confess his sins before God and that only Sandi pardoned sins? How did he know that there is nothing hid from Sandi and that Sandi knows all? How did Tong know that the blood sacrifice represented a substitution atonement for sins? And where did he get the idea that the sins of an entire nation can be imputed onto just one man? These are all biblical doctrines. These are all doctrines and elements of the doctrine of salvation, the gospel. How did he know these things? Well, let me take you to the first mention of human sacrifice in the Bible to shed some light on this. So in Genesis 22, God commands Abraham to sacrifice his own son at the altar in the land of Moriah. When Abraham arrives with his son at the land of Moriah, this is what he says. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. So according to Abraham, God will provide a lamb. Okay, remember that. And they came to the place which God had told them of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thy only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. Now, according to Abraham, God was going to provide a lamb. What God actually provided was a ram. Now, let me ask you a question. Is a ram the same thing as a lamb? They're not the same thing, right? So was, was Abraham mistaken? Why did Abraham say that God would provide a lamb when God actually provided a ram? Did he make a mistake? Did he just not know? Abraham knew the gospel. 
That's why he said lamb. Now, I'd like to do a quick grammar review, and then I'll explain what I just said. Okay? If I gave you a sentence like, Tim met Bob, Tim is called the subject, met is the verb, Bob is the object. If I now gave you a slightly more complicated sentence like, Tim met Bob a plumber, Tim is still a subject, met is still the verb, Bob is an object, plumber is also an object. Who did Tim meet? He met Bob. Who did Tim meet? He met a plumber. Bob is the plumber. Simple grammar, right? So let's take a look at what Abraham said very carefully, all right? This is what Abraham said. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide who? Himself. A lamb. God is the subject. Provide is the verb. Himself is the object. A lamb is the object. What will God provide? Himself. What will God provide? A lamb. Who's the lamb? Himself. Abraham knew the gospel. According to the Apostle Paul, in the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the what? The gospel unto Abraham, saying, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Somebody preached the gospel to Abraham. Somebody else knew the gospel as well. According to the words of Jesus, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. What does that mean? What, do you mean? what does it mean that Abraham saw Jesus' day and was glad? Abraham understood the gospel. Abraham knew the gospel. Now, this is how the Jews responded when, it, when Jesus said those words. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? That's a good question, right? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. What does that mean? What does it mean, before Abraham was, I am? Well, first of all, it means that he already existed before Abraham. And secondly, I am is actually one of the names for the one true God in the Old Testament. It says in Exodus, And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. I am is one of the names for the one true God in the Old Testament. Jesus was claiming to be the one true God of the Old Testament. Jesus is God, with a capital G. Jesus is the Lord. He is Jehovah. He is the I Am. And in the Chinese tongue, he is Sangdi. He is God, with a capital G, come in the flesh. I and my Father are one. Jesus said that. Now, here's a really important verse I want you guys to pay close attention to. To him give all the prophets witness. Who's the him? Jesus. Okay. This is the Apostle Peter speaking. To him, to Jesus, give all the prophets witness. Was Abraham a prophet? He was a prophet. Right? God said he was. Was he the first prophet? Who's the first prophet, according to the Bible? Abel. According to the Bible, Abel was the first prophet. If this verse is true, then all the prophets gave witness to Jesus. Every last one, going all the way back to the very beginning. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, not through the animal sacrifice, every prophet understood that the animal sacrifice was nothing more than just a symbol or a foreshadow of the Messiah, the Savior, the one that is to come, the Christ that is to come. That through his name, whosoever believeth, it's by faith, Whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. It has always been that way since the very beginning. Man has always known the gospel since the beginning, if you take the Bible at face value. According to the first two verses in Romans, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, pay attention now, which he had promised. So what's the gospel? It's a promise. It's not just prophecy. It's a promise. God promised he would way, make a way for sin, since the very time that we left the Garden of Eden, because he kicked us out. Okay? The gospel of God is a promise, which he had promised afore, what does afore mean? In times past, right? By his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and who would be the first one in the Holy Scriptures? Abel, right? And Abel, according to Genesis 4, and Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, what does firstlings mean? The first ones. So the first ones are the firstlings of his flock, 
So what did he bring? A lamb. And of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So God accepted Abel's offering. Now, you'll recall that God rejected Cain's offering. Why is that? How did Abel know that you have to give blood sacrifice and that you do not approach the presence of God without blood sacrifice? How did he know that? That is a biblical doctrine. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sins. That is a biblical doctrine. How did he know those things? It says in Hebrews, by faith, by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. Where does faith come from? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So how did Abel know? God spoke to him. God spoke to him. That is why Christianity is the one and only true religion. It is the most ancient of all religions and is the only religion not invented by man. The gospel is at the very heart of Christianity. And at the very heart of of the gospel is the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the one that is to come. And of course, living in 2016, he has come. That is what makes Christianity the one and only true religion. The gospel is not invented by man. It's revelation from God. And the prophets knew this since ancient times. The gospel is much older than just 2,000 years old. What makes the gospel the good news is the fact that Christ has come, that God fulfilled his promise. But in every generation of human beings, there's always been people who have believed in the truth. There's always been people who, has, who have been saved. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord and took up every clean beast and of every clean fowl and offered burnt offerings unto the altar. Noah knew the same thing. He called those things that be not as though they were. Do you know what that means? It means he knows the end from the beginning. He calleth those things that be not as though they were. And he revealed the things that be not to the prophets since the very beginning. So if we simply take the Bible at face value, in other words, if we just assume the Bible is true, then we would expect to find evidence that our forefathers had a custom of offering blood sacrifice to an almighty supreme God and that they had an understanding of substitution and atonement for sins. So let me ask you the question all over again about Tang, the founder of the Song Dynasty. How did Tang know he needed to confess his sins before God, and that only Song Di pardons sins? How did he know that there is nothing hid from Song Di, and that he is all-knowing? How did Tang know that blood sacrifice represented substitution and atonement for sins? Because remember, he offered himself, he dressed himself up, as the animal sacrifice. Somehow he knew that that animal represented a person. And where did he get the idea that the sins of an entire nation can be imputed onto just one man? How did he know these things? The Bible wouldn't even be translated into Chinese for another 4,000 years. So how did he know? In fact, the vast majority of the Bible wasn't even written yet at the time that he lived. So how did he know? Now, toward the end of the Song Dynasty, we encounter a ruler by the name of Uyi. Uyi is one of the last rulers of the Song Dynasty. He is known to have fashioned a wooden image of Song Di. He mandated the people to adore the image and address their vows to it. This was the first recorded instance in Chinese history of idolatry. Now, Chinese civilization had already been around for more than a thousand years by the time of Uyi. In that entire time, There is not one recorded instance of us, the Chinese people, ever fashioning an idol image, ever. Our most ancient ancestors were primarily monotheistic, primarily, okay? Not completely, but primarily, okay? Uyi has the distinction, if you can call it that, of being the first idolater in our history. According to Sima Qian, Uyi had no morals. I'm going to agree with that. He made the image of a man and called it the spirit of heaven. He played dice with it, causing someone else to play on behalf of the image. When the spirit of heaven lost the game, Uy would disgrace it by hanging a leather bag filled with blood and shot arrows at it, basically splattering blood everywhere, making a big mess. He called this game shooting at heaven. While he was out hunting near the Wei River, he was struck dead by lightning from heaven. Heaven shot back. The common people recognized this as the just and appropriate vengeance of heaven, whom Uyi had insulted. Our ancestors knew that we were never to make an idol image of Sandi, and we almost never did throughout our 5,000 years of history. 
Now, the end of the Song Dynasty led to the beginning of the Zhou Dynasty, when King Wen's conquest of the Song Dynasty marked the end of the Song Dynasty. According to the Su Jing, the Song were defeated because they had become corrupt and did not live up to the virtuous standards that heaven demanded. The Zhou people knew the one true God by the name Heaven, or Tian, who had supreme power over all things. In their own writings, they regarded Song Di as the same deity as Heaven, or Tian, two names for the same supreme God. This is kind of like what happened between Melchizedek and Abraham. You got two different groups of two different ethnicities with two different nationalities, and they accept each other's names for the same one true God. The Zhou rulers also introduced a political doctrine known as the Mandate of Heaven, or Tianming, which became the cornerstone of the Chinese state. All dynasties after the Zhou followed this doctrine. According to this doctrine, Heaven elected certain men and their descendants to be rulers over the world. As long as these men exercised their power with piety, wisdom, and justice, they were deemed worthy to rule. If the ruling family became corrupt, turned their backs on Sunday, and abandoned the virtuous ways, heaven would discard them and elect a new family to rule the world. And this is how one dynasty would overturn another. They also introduced the concept that the ruler was the son of heaven, the Tianzi. Only the son of heaven was worthy enough to worship Sangdi. The common people were forbidden to worship Sangdi. And this is how we began to fall away from Sangdi. From that time forward, the faith of our forefathers became the state religion and not the religion of the common people. Only the ruler was worthy enough to worship Sandi. Before this time, anyone can worship Sandi. And that's the way it ought to be. Most scholars believe that the motivation for this new doctrine was for the consolidation of political power and what happens when the people will not or cannot worship the one true God. They will eventually find something else to worship. And that's what happened eventually to our people. Now, Confucius lived during the latter years of the Zhou dynasty, when the nation was disintegrating. He is considered to be China's greatest sage, philosopher, and teacher. He attempted to restore the glory of the Zhou empire by reviving the moral values of the ancient past, but he was not successful. Confucius held up the golden era of the sage kings Yao and Sun as examples of virtue and wisdom when the nation was at peace. He compiled the Su Jing and other important works, Although Confucius was a great teacher and philosopher, he never claimed to be a god. Yet there are temples throughout the world dedicated to worshiping him. Worshiping Confucius is not our true roots. According to the Confucian Analects, someone once asked the meaning of the great sacrifice. That would be the blood sacrifice to Sandi. The master said, the master is Confucius, I do not know. He who knew its meaning would find it as easy to govern the kingdom as to look on this, pointing to his palm. So by the time of Confucius, the meaning of the great sacrifice, the sacrifice of Sandi, the blood sacrifice of Sandi, had already been lost. But the rituals remained intact. Meaning was lost, rituals were intact. And in fact, Confucius himself was a student of antiquity. He could never quite figure out the meaning of the great sacrifice. And that's something we're going to talk about later, the meaning of the great sacrifice. But he realized it was so important that if you understood its meaning, you qualify to govern the entire empire. Now, Lao Tzu was another philosopher who lived during the same era. The Taoists consider him to be their founder. Religious Taoism begins more than 2,000 years after the founding of Chinese civilization and therefore cannot be our true roots. I mean, it comes in so late in our, in our history. At the, in, at the center of the, his philosophy was the Tao, which is where we get the name Taoism or Taoism, which literally means the way. Now, it turns out that the Bible talks about the Tao as well. Let me show you where. First chapter of John. I'm going to read this in Chinese and I'll flip back and forth between English. Okay? It says, Tai Chu Yo Dao, Dao Yu Sang Di Tong Zai, Dao Chu Su Sang Di. So what this says in English is, in the beginning was the word. And the word, word in the Chinese Bible is Tao. Okay? In the beginning was the Tao, and the Tao was with God, and the Tao was God. All things were created by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Now, if you read the very first paragraph in the Tao Te Ching, the book that Lao Tzu wrote, he actually says that Tao is the creator of all things. Now, the thing that Lao Tzu didn't know is this next verse. Okay? It says, Tao ten ro sen zhu zai wo men zong jian. The Tao became flesh and dwelt among us. And who would that be? Who became flesh? What, what's the flesh? It's 
Jesus, right? The Word became flesh and lived among us. 匆匆忙忙的有恩典有真理，我们也见过他的荣光，正是父独生子的荣光。And Jesus saith unto him, "I am the way, I am the doubt, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me." Confucius says, "He who offends heaven has none to whom he can pray." The Bible says, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God." Every single person in this room has sinned. Everyone has come short of the glory of God. Everyone has offended heaven at some point or another. 因为世人都犯了罪，亏缺了上帝的荣耀。If the only wrong thing you've ever done your whole life was to tell one small white lie, you've offended heaven. You've sinned. Heaven is holy. Heaven is just. Heaven is righteous. Heaven hates sin. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is the good news of the gospel. 因为罪的公价乃是死，唯有上帝的恩赐，在我们的主基督耶稣里乃是永生。那个就是福音。All right. So back to Chinese history. This unity within the Zhou Empire eventually leads to internal warfare among the states, who all struggled for supremacy. So the Zhou Empire was disintegrating. All the states were breaking apart, breaking away from the empire, and they're all fighting each other. This was a time of great political, social, moral, cultural, and religious chaos. There was a lot of bloodshed during this era. The wars lasted for more than 200 years until 221 BC. When the state of Qin emerged as the final victor after conquering all the other states, reuniting China. Upon his conquest, the ruler of Qin assumes the title Qin Shi Huangdi, or First Emperor of Qin. Qin comes the name of the state. Shi means first or beginning. Huang means splendid or shining, which is formally applied only as a reference to heaven, the high god of the Zhou. And Di means emperor, but also meant the high god of the sun. So basically, when he put these two words together, Huang Di, he basically was saying, "I'm God." He's claiming to be God, and of course, all the rulers after him adopted the same title, Huang Di. He's the one who invented that term. In 1974, the tomb of the first emperor was discovered in Xi'an, along with a vast army of terracotta soldiers, horses, and other artifacts. The first emperor standardized the writing system, currency, weights, and measures. He enslaved millions of people to begin construction of the Great Wall. There were other emperors after him that expanded the Great Wall, but he was the first to begin it. He also introduced idolatry to the worship of Sang Di. According to our own historians, it was the family of Qin which erected four altars to offer sacrifices to the white, green, yellow, and red Di's. The founder of the Han Dynasty adopted the practice and even added the northern altar for the worship of the black Di. Basically. Idols of his own invention, gods of his own invention. Chen was fascinated with the number six. He mandated that the number six be the basis of all numerology in the empire. Official hats shall be six inches in height. All carriages shall be drawn by six horses. A pace shall be six feet. And of course, we all know the famous number six six six, the number of the beast, the number of the antichrist in the Bible. You can kind of tell what kind of spirit was working behind him, can't you? The first emperor hated Confucianism. In 213 BC, on the advice of his prime minister Li Si, he issued the infamous order: burn the books and bury the Confucian scholars alive, or fen shu keng ru. For a while, the book of history, the Su Jing, was thought to have been lost forever in the fires of Qin. In 102 BC, the Prince of Lu began to demolish the old house of Confucius to enlarge his own palace. As Confucius' house was being dismantled, ancient texts, including a copy of the Book of History, the Sujing was discovered hidden within the walls. The truth about our roots would have been lost forever had someone not hidden those books within those walls. And of course, if we had lost lost that book, I wouldn't be standing here telling you the message tonight. So it is my opinion that、um, it was by the grace of God that we did not lose the records of our own history, the records of our roots. In 206 BC, rebel leader Liu Bang overthrows the Qin Dynasty and founds the Han Dynasty. He adopts the idolatrous practice of sacrificing to the four Di's and even adds the black Di. So now they're totally worshiping idols. The practice of worshiping these five false gods continued all the way to the time of the Ming Dynasty, a span of 1,500 years. According to our own historians, when the Zhou Dynasty was in its decline, rites and music became corrupted amid the contending states. 
and perished at last under Chin. So at the time of Confucius, the meaning of the great sacrifice had been lost, but the ritual still remained intact. By the time of Chin, the rituals had been corrupted. The book of history says absolutely nothing about the five false deeds that the first emperor introduced and worshipped. For the next 1,500 years, idolatry became a part of the state religion of our leaders. Sadly, it wouldn't be long before the common people also adopted idolatry as a way of life. In 67 BC, Buddhism enters China from India and gains widespread popularity. Buddha never claimed to be a deity or to be divinely inspired. Buddhism is a religion of Indian origins. It did not originate with the Chinese people and therefore cannot be the true roots of our people. For about 2,000 years, the Chinese people were primarily, not 100%, but primarily monotheistic. After Buddhism, this was not true anymore. We fell into idolatry and turned our backs on the one true God of our forefathers. And there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. What happened to Israel during the time of the judges happened to our people thousands of years ago. There arose another generation who turned their backs on Sangdi and forgot all his works for China. And what happened to us in China thousands of years ago is actually happening right now in this country, the United States. If you think about it, about a generation ago, what happened at the Supreme Court level? They started taking the Bible, the Ten Commandments, the prayer, you know, anything and everything that was related to Christianity was taken out of the schools. Our school system used to be a very Christian-oriented school system. And now, one generation later, what has happened to our country? We've become very pagan and heathen, right? We're becoming more and more pagan every day, right? I don't think we can honestly call this country a Christian country anymore. It used to be, but if you were honest with yourself, I don't think it'd be really hard for me to call it a Christian country by the way we're going. At about the same time when we turned our backs on God and adopted idolatry, God sent Jesus to die for us on the cross for our sins. I am reminded of this verse in Romans 5.8, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and certainly we were sinners. We, had, we began to worship idols. It says in Chinese, From the Han Dynasty to the beginning of the Ming Dynasty, our emperors continued to worship the five false deeds. At the commencement of the dynasty, the Ming appointed two committees to investigate and research all subjects regarding rites and music. After they completed their research, they abolished the worship of the five false gods that Qin had introduced. In 1406 AD, they began construction of the Temple of Heaven, the Tiantan, and completed it in 1420 AD. The Ming attempted to reestablish the original faith of our forefathers during the Xia, Song, and Zhou dynasties. That was their main purpose. This is an aerial view of the Temple of Heaven, the Tiantan. Tian means heaven, Tan means altar. Why it's called Temple of Heaven in English, I don't know. But somehow, somebody made that up, I guess, and that's what stuck. There is a temple structure on the premises, but the emphasis in Chinese is the altar. That's the altar right there, that structure there. The temple structure is over here. The Temple of Heaven is located in southeast Beijing. Among the sights and sounds of China, only the Great Wall and the Forbidden City rival it as a tourist attraction. It was built and dedicated specifically for the worship of Sangdi. There is not a single idol found anywhere within the Temple of Heaven complex. Not a single idol. If Buddhism, Taoism, the worship of Confucius, or our ancestors is truly our roots, why is there not a single idol found anywhere in the Temple of Heaven complex? The very purpose for which this structure was built was to reestablish our faith the, for, the, the faith of our forefathers. And it was here that the emperor would come to sacrifice and worship Sandi once a year on the winter solstice, which is approximately December 22nd. Three days before the sacrifice, the emperor would begin a fast. For the first two days, he fasted at the forbidden city. During the fast, he used to abstain from food, all forms of entertainment, sexual relations, and the handling of judicial and criminal cases. I'm reminded of this verse. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. The emperor had to prepare his heart before he could meet God. 
This is a map of the Temple of Heaven. On the left side is the fasting palace, the Zai Gong. On the last and third day of his fast, the emperor will leave the imperial palace and enter the fasting palace, the Zai Gong. This is a picture of the front entrance of the Zai Gong, the fasting palace. After the emperor completes his last day of fasting, he enters the imperial vault of heaven, the Huang Cheng Yu, which is this structure over here. Here's a picture of the imperial vault of heaven. Inside, there are no idols in the sanctuary, but a throne to Sandi. The emperor bows and invites the spirits of his dead ancestors to come and worship God together. They are all subservient to Sandi. Here is an up-close picture of the throne. On top of the throne is no idol, but a tablet with inscriptions, Huang Tian Sandi, the name of the one true God in our culture. Now, notice there's some squiggly lines on the left. Any, does anyone know what those squiggly lines are? It's Manchurian. Why, is it, why are there Manchurian words on a Chinese tablet? The last, exactly, the Qing dynasty. The last dynasty was a Manchurian dynasty. It was not a Han Chinese dynasty. Even the Manchurians acknowledged, though they were not Han Chinese, they acknowledged Sandi as the one and only true supreme god of the universe. Behold, I am the Lord, the god of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? The Lord is not just the god of the Chinese. He's also the god of the Manchurians. He's also not just the god of the Manchurians. He's the god of the white man, the black man, the yellow man, the whatever color of spectrum you want to pick, man. He is the god of all flesh, and there is nothing too hard for him. After the emperor invites the spirits to partake in the worship service, he heads towards the altar, the Yuan Chiu Tan. That's the altar down here, which Yuan Chiu Tan is round mound altar, the same type of altar that Sun offered 4,000 years ago, more than 4,000 years ago. Here's a picture of the emperor walking towards the altar. This was taken from a 2014 reenactment sponsored by the Chinese government once a year. And this reenactment is actually performed at the actual premises of the Temple of Heaven. So you can, get to, you can get a free show basically once a year. They basically reenact all the rituals and ceremonies that the emperor performed on the winter solstice. This is the front gates to the altar. Once you've entered, this is what the altar looks like. And this is an artist's rendition of what the emperor did at this altar. It was here that the most powerful man of the largest nation on earth publicly bowed to the name of Sandi. The man who bows to no man on this day will bow. He kneeled three times and bowed nine times, which was the highest expression of reference in our culture. This is the emperor right here, and he's bowing publicly in front of his most highest ranking officials. This is a shrine with it underneath a tablet, the same tablet I showed you earlier with the inscriptions, Huang Tian Sandi. He bows to just the name of Sandi. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, he's bound to just the name, to his, that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. At the top of the altar, at the center, lies a special stone. This circular stone has a name. It's called Tian Xing Su. Literally, it means the heart of heaven. Tian means heaven, Xing means heart, Su means stone. Literally, it means the heart of heaven stone. The emperor would stand on top of this stone to offer lambs or oxen to Sandi as blood sacrifice. Now, what do you think might be the significance of this stone? Why would the ancients call it the heart of heaven? Allow me to take you to something similar that happened to Israel in the book of Joshua. Now, in the book of Joshua, we learn that after the children of Israel had crossed the Jordan River, God commanded Joshua to go back into the riverbed and fetch 12 stones. And what did Joshua do with those 12 stones? It says here, and those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. He made an altar at Gilgal. The first thing the children of Israel did after they crossed Jordan River and they began to inherit land was to build an altar to the Lord. And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean this, these stones? That's a good question to ask. Then you shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. So what is the function and purpose of those 12 stones? What was the function and purpose? Those 12 stones were to serve as a testimony of the great things that God has done in their nation's history. That was their purpose. They were to always remember the things that God had did for them. So let's ask the same question at our altar. 
What mean this stone? Why would the ancients build this altar, and why would they name the center stone the heart of heaven? What does this place have anything to do with the heart of heaven himself? If you read the Bible from cover to cover and summarize the main point, what would it be about? What would be the main point be? Would it not be about a great sacrifice? Would it not be about a blood sacrifice? Would it not be about a man who was called the Lamb of God who was that sacrifice? Isn't that what's in God's very own heart? So what mean the stone? And what did it have anything to do with the emperor offering blood sacrifice at that very spot? The Chinese character for the word righteousness points us to the truth about the great sacrifice. The word for righteousness in Chinese is yi, which is composed, it's this word here, which is composed of the word lamb, yang, and wo, which means me. It is literally a picture of a lamb covering me, who makes me righteous. The word atonement in the English language means to cover. The lamb covering me, the lamb atones for, for me, and that's what makes me righteous. And the word me itself is composed of so, which means hand, and ge, which is a spear-like weapon. The word for righteousness in the Chinese language, literally is a picture of a person holding a weapon, killing a lamb. Now, Professor Zhao Yuping, who is a secular professor, meaning he's not a Christian, he's a professor at Beijing University of Post and Telecommunications. He has a doctorate in Guoxue, which is ancient Chinese civilization. He is a regular lecturer on several national shows in China. He is author of the best-selling book, Liang San Zhen Zi, which is reprinted 12 times. He is named by the state media as one of the top 10 Chinese culture lecturers. So this guy has quite a few credentials. Okay? And again, I reemphasize he's a secular professor, meaning he's not a Christian. Let me show you what he says. He's done a detailed study on this etym the etymology of this word, the word for righteousness in the Chinese language. Let me show you what he says. Go ahead and play the video. Uh,我是来自美国,所以经常我是做一些的中英文翻译,但是我觉得特别是一几个字,怎么翻译成英文? 它都是带阳字的 now, I know that went by kind of fast for most of you, if you don't know Chinese, and the subtitle in English was not translated very well. So what I did was I typed out the transcript, and we're going to go over this line by line so we all actually understand what the professor said, okay? So the question was asked from the audience by an American scholar in Beijing, she said, Translation, how do we translate the word e into English? This was the response from the professor. If you allow me to give you advice, this would be my advice. Find an English word that has the corresponding meaning. This word should have the following meaning. 繁体字的意字怎么写? How is the word e for righteousness written in traditional Chinese script? On the top of the character is the word yang for lamb, which means lamb. On the bottom is the word wo, which means me. The word yang for lamb in ancient times represents fortune, auspiciousness, and an offering for sacrifice. How do our ancient ancestors know that? So you can see, the sun, 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 the word sun, which means good or kind-hearted, the word mei, beautiful, and the word xiang, auspicious, all contains the word yang for lamb within it. 
。为什么呢？古人用羊来祭祀。Why is this? The ancients used the lamb as an offering for sacrifice. How did our ancestors know to do that? So it represents the sacrifice and the faith related. Therefore, it, referring to the lamb, represents an offering of sacrifice and is related to faith and belief. What does righteousness have anything to do with faith and belief? For what saith the Scripture? That's always a good question to ask. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. How do you obtain righteousness in the sight of God? Through faith, through belief. 经上说什么呢？说亚伯拉罕信上帝，这就算为他的义。亚伯拉罕信上帝，这就是他的义。义跟信仰有关。下面那我呢？我其实是一种兵器，后来成为一种仪器的仪器的仪式。What about the word "wall" on the bottom? The word "wall" is actually a form of weaponry. It later became a ceremonial instrument. So, as I was saying earlier, the word "wall" is actually composed of a hand holding a weapon. The word for righteousness is literally a picture of someone killing a lamb, shedding its blood. 那么我们把这个两个东西简单的结合在一起，你能得出一个结论。So if you put these two concepts together, you can come to a conclusion. This "e" and a kind of faith are related. The word "e" for righteousness is related to faith. It is only in the spirit and in the action that it can be sustained and sustained, and it can be paid for. It can be sacrificed. It means to have mental and behavioral perseverance and endurance and a willingness to pay the price and sacrifice. Sounds kind of like what Jesus did for us on the cross, doesn't it? Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. 如果英文里边没有这个词，那我们只能用直接把这个 e 汉语拼音搁上去。然后呢，我们下面给解释。If the English language does not have such a word that means this, then we can only use the pinyin for e, which is y i, and write an explanation as a footnote. 说所谓的义，就是为一种坚守付出的代价。What is called 义 for righteousness is based on perseverance in paying the price. Sounds like the concept of redemption to me. So, if you put summarize everything that this professor is saying, the word for righteousness 义 contains within it the concept of an offering of blood sacrifice, of faith. And of redemption or the perseverance in paying the price. Do you know what that means? I mean, it essentially contains the gospel message, doesn't it? Isn't that the gospel message? And a secular professor is telling you so. He just probably doesn't realize he's telling you so. But how can that be? How can such an ancient word contain the gospel message? This word is extremely ancient. It goes all the way back to the. Beginnings of our civilization. You find this this word used in all the ancient texts. You find it used in the Song Oracle Bones. How can such an ancient word contain the gospel message in its own etymology? Well, I believe our forefathers once knew the gospel, just like Abraham did. What will God provide? Himself. What will God provide? A lamb. That's why the word lamb is in the word for righteousness. But the word for me is also there too. The lamb died for me. The lamb came to redeem me. The lamb came to cover my sins. And the word "me" is a picture of me holding a spear, killing the lamb. Our sins kill the lamb on the cross. Going back to the temple of heaven, after offering sacrifices at the altar, the emperor proceeded to the Danby Bridge. That would be this structure here. Heading towards the hall of prayer, the Qinian Dian. That would be this structure here. Here's a picture of the Danby Bridge. Here's a picture of the emperor walking on the Danby Bridge, taken from the same 2014 reenactment. While the emperor walked along the Danby Bridge, the sacrificial animals were led through an arched gateway called the Gates of Hell, Guimen Guan. This was a tunnel system traversing east-west underneath the bridge. Sacrificial animals were not allowed to walk on the bridge. 
There's a picture of the gates of hell. Why would our ancestors name this the gates of hell? Could our ancestors have understood that the sacrificial animal symbolically took the penalties of their sins? It says in 2 Corinthians, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that, he might be made, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus became sin for us so that we can be made the righteousness of God. Here's a young man, a very good-looking and handsome young man, very smart young man too, by the way. You may or may not recognize him. Here's a young man saved from the gates of hell by the blood of the Lamb. And yes, I used to be fatter back then. And here are two brothers in Christ who are both saved from the gates of hell by the blood of Jesus. Let me tell you about this other man. I wrote a little testimony about him. And he has a lot to do with this presentation tonight, to be quite honest. The man to the left on the screen is Pastor Ray Petzl. He was my pastor for many years at the church I attended in my youth in Arcadia, California. The year was 1993 when I I was only 17 years old then, when Pastor Ray first shared with me his research on Chinese spiritual roots. His research profoundly affected my life. That's why I'm giving you this message, because I just want to pass on the same blessing to others. At the age of 18, I realized that to further the research and to more effectively share this message with others, I had to learn the Chinese language. I basically started learning Chinese at 18. Okay? So what did I do? I got several Chinese dictionaries and began to memorize them. I learned the hard way, okay? instead of going to school. That was how I learned to read and write Chinese. I've never stopped learning since. In fact, I plan to continue to learn until the day I die. Chinese is my weaker language, so if I said something wrong tonight, for those of you who speak Chinese fluently, and, and that's your strong language, please forgive me. My main motivation is simply to share this message more effectively in the hopes that I might win people to Christ. If there are some of you here tonight who are not believers, my hope is that you might believe tonight and be saved, that you will not wait another night. In 1999, I took Pastor Ray's research and condensed the main points into this booklet. In 1999, this booklet only existed in the English language. We're going to give this out to you afterwards. So you definitely want to stay tuned. The following year, my wife, who's sitting right here, translated the booklet into Chinese, and later, Pastor Ray's wife refined the translation even further. That's where this booklet comes from. It's basically a Chinese translation, but it has some refinements and has some things on it that the English doesn't have. That same year, the year 2000, Pastor Ray published his doctoral thesis on the Chinese spiritual roots, and I have his doctoral thesis right here. It's kind of thick. This is the culmination of 20 years of research, just so you know. I've given you a very, 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 very simplified version of this doctoral thesis, okay? And yeah, I read it cover to cover when I was just a teenager. In the year 2002, Pastor Ray and I went to Beijing together to take pictures of the Temple of Heaven and to meet with some of the believers there. That's when these pictures you see behind me on the screen were taken. My faith grew tremendously through Pastor Ray's preaching and teaching, and a lot of what I know in the scriptures began with what he taught. He is also the one who baptized me and officiated at my wedding with my wife, and I consider him my mentor in the faith. And just so you know, I actually did not know my mom was going to come until fairly recently. My mom was never able to convince me to learn Chinese, okay? I had to realize that it was important that I, re- that I learned Chinese, okay? That it was important to know my own roots and to share it with others. Sorry, Mom. Um, anyway, this is the more personal side of the message that I wanted to share with you tonight, and I just want to make sure that Pastor Ray got the credit, because I want to make sure that um, he, he, you know, give credit to where credit is due. So I'm just sort of taking the torch. Isaac Newton once said, if I had seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, and I do consider Pastor Ray a spiritual giant in my life, And it's always a blessing if you have a spiritual giant in your life to sort of disciple you. So let me now share a message um, from Pastor Ray. Go ahead and click on that. It's amazing that every God in China, it's amazing that every God in China can be traced back to a point in time when that God began to be worshipped. Only one God in Chinese history doesn't have a beginning, and that's Shangdi. He always existed, he was always there, and the Chinese always worshipped him as the supreme god who controlled everything. In the year 2000, the government of China concluded a five-year project on the chronology of early Chinese history. Experts in nine disciplines of scientific research concluded that the ancient written histories are indeed reliable.
The 1995 study had linguists who were experts at analyzing ancient Chinese writing. They also had uh, uh, physicists who did carbon-14 dating and verified the age of a lot of the uh, materials that they were uncovering through archaeology. The China Project was also able to verify the fact that Emperor Shun in 2200 BC offered sacrifice to Shangdi. And this was verified by the astronomers because they showed that only an eyewitness could have known uh, the astronomical events that were taking place and that were recorded in that very same history. And in fact, the Bible does tell us that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He was the one last sacrifice sent by God to take away all sin of all mankind for all time. He said 100%. So let's go back now to the uh, Temple of Heaven. After the animals were slaughtered, sl slaughtered, they were burned at the firewood stove, the fine Sai Lu, as burnt offerings to Sun Di, kind of like what Noah did. The emperor then enters the courtyard of the Hall of Prayer, the Qin Yan Dian. His entourage sing praises and perform dances to worship Sun Di. After the song and dance, the emperor turns and faces the house of prayer, the Qin Yan Dian, and enters God's presence. He offers wine and prayers for the nation. Once the ceremony has concluded, the emperor issues a pardon. What does the great sacrifice have anything to do with a pardon for sins, do you think? It says in Colossians, in whom we have redemption through his blood, Jesus Christ, even the forgiveness of sins. Isn't that what a pardon is, a forgiveness of sins? 我们在爱子里蒙得蒙救赎，爱子就是主耶稣。我们在爱子里蒙得蒙救赎，罪过得以赦免。我的罪过得以赦免，这个就是祭天之礼的真正意义。这个就是我们祖先留下来给我们的见
that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all you have to do. It's by faith. Believe with your heart, confess with your mouth. That's it. 你若口里认耶稣为主，心里信上帝，叫他从死里复活，就必得救。你愿意得救吗 ？So, if you are not a believer tonight and you want to be, then I ask that you pray the following prayer with me. Lord, we come before you. I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell for my sins. I trust in you and you alone for my salvation, Lord. Please take me with you to heaven when I die. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.